that's gone live and it's going sending data to YouTube and Facebook. So I'm just going to play that countdown timer. I will be starting in roughly four and a half minutes, just doing the final things, trying to get the dog away and all that jazz. It's all live, so everything could go anyway. Up. So just heading live now with Ryan Campbell, about to start in about three minutes. All right, welcome to episode two of Adventure Thinking Live. Now, we have a really, really cool interview with a fascinating bloke. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's an absolute champion, been a mate for a couple of years now, Ryan Campbell. And look, it is our first real interview. I say that because sure. thinking jingle. Welcome to Adventure Thinking, an intimate series of live video podcasts that explores the mindset born from challenge, adversity, and living a life of no regrets. I'm Jonesy, your host, and for the past 20 years, I have been lucky to have embarked on some crazy expeditions and returned transformed with some pretty epic tales to share. Each week, I'll be bringing adventure stories and mindsets down from the proverbial mountaintop as we dive into the hearts and minds of some of the world's greatest adventurers. These are people that have achieved truly phenomenal undertakings against all odds 
and have returned better for it. So, do you want to live more adventurously? This is Adventure Thinking. All right, so stoked about our next guest, Ryan Campbell. And Ryan is going to be beaming in from Nashville, Tennessee, all the way on the other side of the world. So it's 9 p.m. over there. So he's probably cracked a beer or a port or done something like that. And I'm having a a coffee right now. And uh, uh, Ryan, I've known for a few years. And he is an amazing, amazing bloke. Uh, He's a world record setting pilot. He's a paraplegic plane crash survivor, and he's a kick-ass speaker on the, on the circuit over in the States. And Ryan and I actually first met a few years back at, I think it was an Australian Geographic Awards uh, ceremony, where he just won the, uh, the title, or I suppose, of Young Australian Adventurer of the Year. And he might be a little bit older now. You know, he's got a, more facial hair than I have, but I'm going to pull Ryan in. Ryan, how are you today, mate? I'm good, Jonesy. How are you doing? Yeah, great, mate. Fantastic. Great to have you on the show. No, nah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so, Ryan, I, I've, I've pulled you in here as the first real guest because one, I know you're you're a fascinating person, but two, uh, you're going to not mind if I stumble every now and then and you're not going to absolutely hold that against me because this is what life is all about. It's not about perfection. It's about just progress. And we are learning by the seat of our pants. I was just online with you a couple of hours ago and everything was going wrong. But now it seems to be working. So we're back, I think, are we? Is that safe to say? Or have I just jinxed us? Um, there are a very intimate series of interviews with some fascinating world-class explorers, adventurers, all sorts of people from right around the world who have pushed their body, their minds to the absolute limit in different facets of adventure. And what we're going to do is we're going to throw off the first part of the show is actually going to be that person. So Ryan today is going to tell us a bit of a story, a bit of a tale of his background, his history, his life, and take us on a ride. And then we're going to jump into a bit of an in-depth Q&A where also you can ask questions as well. Uh, I've already got three comments actually up on on, the, on Facebook actually. So thanks for watching guys. Thank you, Carla. Uh, I need some adventure thinking today is what she said, smiley face. And so we're going to jump into it. So Ryan, if you feel up to it, I'm going to throw to you because I want to hear a little bit of a story that you think people need to hear right now. 100%. I appreciate uh, appreciate it, Jonesy. Uh, challenge, adversity, and no regrets uh, popped up at the start of this adventure thinking uh, little video. And I absolutely love that, the challenge and the adversity aspect, but also the no regrets. And straight off the top of my head, as a speaker here in the States, I speak a lot on mindset and resilience, uh, how we can face adversity and use that to fuel our journey to whatever the next level is. And I think building that confidence level uh, through having tools uh, that help us navigate change, which is what I speak on here in the States, allows us to live a life with no regrets, to take bigger risks. And um, there was no bigger inspiration for me, Jonesy. I'm going to throw you in the deep end. When I was a young kid watching Jonesy and Kaz uh, kayak to New Zealand, which I still think is nuts, uh, watching you boys do that was a massive inspiration for me to go out and live a life that was full of challenges. Unfortunately, it led to a whole bunch of adversity, but allowed me to live a life with no regrets. So straight out the gate, um, I want to say, I want to, I want to, I did did not pay you to do that champion. Honestly, I did not pay you to do that. You're not meant to talk about me. It's about you, mate. It's about you. No, I I didn't even tell you I was going to do that, but um, straight out the gate, challenge, adversity, no regrets. I absolutely love it. So what I want to do is, I want to jump back. I want to tell you my story, give you a little bit of an idea as to how I ended up here. And uh, after that, as Jones, you said, we'll dive in. We'll talk about uh, adversity, change, challenges, and the mindset to uh, navigate our way through them. When I was 17 years old, for some reason, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to want to fly a single engine airplane solo around the world. Now, I don't know why at 17, you really don't know a lot about much. However, uh, I wanted to pursue this dream. So I did what any 17 year old uh, wannabe adventurer would do. And I Googled how to fly solo around the world. And everyone laughs at me, but I found a website, how to fly solo around the world. Now I printed off all the information. I highlighted all the important parts and I hid it in my desk, in my office. Now I hid it because I didn't want my family to, to find that. I didn't want my mum to go and clean my room and, and come across this paperwork. I didn't want them to think that I actually thought this was possible. Now, after I'd read all there was in those articles, at that point in time, 
to give you a little bit of context, more people have been to space and flown solo around the world. So there wasn't a lot of information available. Once I'd read those same six articles over and over again, I decided I wanted to go and take it a step further. Now, I didn't know how to do that, but I decided I would contact a guy by the name of Dick Smith. Now, when you speak in America like I do now, no one knows who Dick Smith is. And I wanted to speak with him to show how to fly solo around the world. I Googled Dick Smith's email address, I should say, and I found five. Uh, now, I sent an email to all five. Uh, it was, Dear Dick, my name's Ryan Campbell. I have 200 flying hours, and uh, I want to be the youngest person to fly solo around the world. Now, Dick Smith actually replied, and uh, he wrote me an email. It was a long email. And throughout it, he said, it's hard. What you want to do is dangerous. It's expensive. And it's never been done before. But all that mattered was right at the end, he gave me five words. But it can be done. Now, Dick told me, just like he told Jess Watson, to go and find a mentor, someone who could support me, someone who could back me, and to, to tell Dick that I was the guy for the job. I could get this done safely. So being, again, a lazy teenager, I took that same email, Dear Dick, changed it to Dear Ken, and I sent it to a guy called Ken. Now, he'd flown around the world back in 2008. He knew all about the adventure uh, and the, I suppose, logistics involved in taking a small aircraft and circumnavigating the globe. Now, Ken Evers agreed to be my mentor. So I took that email, I forwarded it on to Dick. I said, hey, Dick, remember me. I'd like you to meet Ken. Now, at this point in time, I had uh, a team of two. The problem was I hadn't told another soul. I had not told my mum or my dad. Now, that's an interesting conversation. So one night after washing the dishes, which I think helped, I looked at my dad and I said, hey, dad, what would you say if I said, yeah, maybe I might want to one day potentially fly a single engine airplane solo around the world? His response was, that will be pretty cool. Now I turned to my mum, who is, you know, text me when you get there, mum. And I looked at her and I thought, this can only go well. I said, hey, mum, what do you think about this idea of uh, me wanting to fly solo around the world? And her response was, uh, you would see some pretty cool things. Now I took a folder of emails, all the emails from Dick Smith, all laid out in chronological order, all color coded. I wanted to make this the easiest process that there had ever been. And I sat them down in front of my mum and my dad. When they opened that folder, they realized how serious I actually was. And at that point in time, my team of two now become a team of four. My mum and dad jumped on board and they agreed to help support me uh, in this wild, wild adventure. What followed from that point was two years of planning, uh, preparing, training as a pilot. Uh, I was 17 years old preparing to fly solo around the world. We fundraised a quarter of a million dollars on a laptop computer pulled together a massive team uh, of people within the aviation industry and abroad, uh, a team of people who believed that we could pull off something that had never been done before. Uh, we took a single engine airplane uh, that was designed to fly only five hours and we modified it to uh, uh, add 160 gallon, that's uh, my US speak coming up, but 160 gallons of fuel inside that cockpit uh, to allow it to fly the long overwater legs that we would need to tackle uh, to make it around the world. After two years of planning and pulling that big uh, adventure together, I found myself in Wollongong uh, at 19 years old with the opportunity to climb into that airplane to take off and attempt the record. What followed uh, was 24,000 nautical miles to 35 stops uh, in 15 countries in that tiny little aeroplane. It was a wild journey that not only taught me Pacific Ocean, so, uh, and from Christmas Island to Hawaii, I flew through what was known as the Intertropical Convergence Zone, which was a band of bad weather that moves up and down around the equator, depending on what time of the year it is. As I took off from Christmas Island, air traffic control called up to let me know that there was a thunderstorm on my planned track to Hawaii. In fact, it went from sea level to 60,000 feet. So this was the first major hurdle that I'd faced on the round the world flight. We ended up diverting 180 nautical miles right of track to make our way around that center core of the storm, but managed to finally make it to Hawaii. From Hawaii to California, as you can see on the map, it was the longest leg, over 2,100 miles 
in a single engine aeroplane all over water, the longest ferry leg uh, of any round the world flight. I took off early uh, about 2 or 3 a.m. from Hawaii. I watched the sun come up about five hours later. I flew all the way through the day, watched the sun set, and then arrived in the Los Angeles Basin 15 hours later. Unbelievably glad to get out of that aeroplane. From that point, I worked my way across North America, which was simply a whole lot of fun, up into Canada and then across the North Atlantic Ocean, one of the more risky uh, legs of the entire trip. Between uh, Goose Bay in Canada and Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, we had temperatures of minus 19 degrees and we had ice that formed uh, on the aircraft. Not only would it stick to the wing, from Reykjavik, Iceland, I went down to Wick, Scotland and uh, ended up uh, in Europe. From Europe, I went uh, down through England, France, Greece, diverted around Egypt, which was in crisis at the time. I uh, found myself descending over the Red Sea to land uh, in Aqaba, Jordan. From Jordan, it was nine hours across Saudi Arabia to Muscat, Oman, uh, down to Colombo, Sri Lanka, across to Malaysia. Indonesia and into the west coast of Australia. Now, as I arrived in Broome, I was then given the opportunity to hop my way across my own country, which I'd never done before. Uh, that leg home or multiple legs of days and 180 hours of flying earlier, we created history. We had an opportunity to do something that had never been done before. Uh, I had broken the world record, become the youngest pilot to fly solo around the world, but also the first teenager in history uh, to have ever achieved that feat. As good as that was, and as much as that was our intention in the beginning, it wasn't what was important to us. What was important was the way that that flight affected not only myself and everyone directly involved in that uh, adventure, but the way that flight touched a whole number of people around the world. My mum even had to pressure me to uh, submit the Guinness World Record uh, paperwork to have that record uh, approved. I'm sure glad she did, but that just gives you an idea of how much weight the record did not hold at that point in time, how important it was to take away the life tools and lessons uh, from that adventure. All I can say to you is life was good. Uh, you're about to hear how life changed in a split second, but before we do that, I actually want to throw you in the airplane. Now, it's one thing to look at a map around the world. They put together some amazing content. So I want to share a little bit of that with you. It's a video called Extra Minutes, Fly and Ryan's Top 5 Landings. Let's have a watch. Extra Minutes. Echo Hotel, Oscar Lemon Sierra, now in a right down for one nine. Echo Hotel, Oscar Lemon Sierra, one tower, one nine. Clear to land, traffic will be departing prior to your arrival. Every time, it's just a normal Aussie kid. I always tell everyone here in the US, any more laid back, I'd be lying down. So many phenomenal things happened uh, just in life in general. I was named 
along with the one and only Jonesy as one of Australia's 50 greatest explorers, uh, which honestly was uh, a life highlight to be named uh, next to people such as James Cook. And I tell everyone here, he is the guy who drove the boat to Australia. Uh, to be put next to uh, names that you grew up in school learning about uh, is an unbelievably humbling experience and such an honour. Along with that, uh, the opportunity to meet the royals and uh, do all sorts of wild, crazy things. I remember meeting Prince William. Uh, and when you stand in front of a prince talking about adventure uh, and flying, you suddenly realise that your life has taken a unique turn. However, you remind yourself you're just a normal kid when you don't want to eat any of the weird food at the reception and you end up unbelievably overdressed at KFC right afterwards. Uh, now, all of those amazing things uh, led to uh, speaking on the Australian circuit, uh, releasing a book called Born to Fly. Uh, Born to Fly was the story of the, actually the new version uh, that's out in the States at the moment. A bunch of these amazing things were happening, but unfortunately, in a split second moment, my life went from a uh, unbelievable high to an unbelievable low in a split second moment. On December 28, 2015, I went to work, uh, simply a normal day, uh, flying a vintage 1930s biplane up and down the coast of Australia. My job was to take people for a fly, to fly up the beach, do some light aerobatics. I had a phenomenal job. We were flying a phenomenal machine. We loaded up and we taxied to the end of the runway uh, on a normal day. No oceans to cross, no records to break, and we took off. As the runway disappeared below me, the engine failed. I pushed the nose down and did everything I could in the very few seconds we had before it was too late. What resulted was not only a horrendous plane crash, uh, but an unbelievably uh, horrific outcome. I was cut from the wreckage uh, and flown to hospital as the only survivor. I was... Uh, operated on immediately, shattered from head to toe, broken facial bones, broken ankle, five breaks in my back. I woke up in a recovery ward uh, knowing something was very wrong. I had no movement or feeling from my waist down. I had, in fact, damaged my spinal cord uh, at L1 and I had been dying in the world or any adventure I had ever been involved in could have ever been. I spent six months in a spinal rehabilitation ward. I spent 18 months uh, total in rehabilitation, a journey not just back to uh, walking in my mind, uh, my very naive mind at that point in time, but a journey back to flying. I had every day a whole bunch of things uh, to get done in spinal rehabilitation ward. Uh, I would climb into my wheelchair in the morning. Uh, in the early days, being hoisted into that wheelchair, I would go through hours of my bathroom routine, showering, just prepping for the day, being dressed, all of these uh, experiences that were unbelievably foreign to a 21-year-old kid. We had a roster just like at school, a timetable that told me where to go and where to be. We had two physio uh, physiotherapy sessions every day. Uh, we had meetings with a psychologist. We had patient education. We were learning not only to live life uh, in a wheelchair and to live life with a spinal cord injury, but we were learning to operate a wheelchair. We were uh, pushing our bodies every single day to uh, see how well they could recover, to find out what our new maximum potential and therefore new normal was. I spent a very long time in that rehabilitation gym. Uh, the fun that we had was wheelchair basketball on a Wednesday night, but what walking frame you can see right there. Physiotherapists would help me stand and then help me shuffle my legs, grabbing my heels, moving them forward. Uh, that shuffling then led to a walking frame. That walking frame led to a uh, set of crutches and on and on and on. List of permanent damage. I have no uh, calf muscles, no glute muscles, very little feeling on the backs of my legs or my feet or where I sit. Uh, internal systems are damaged, no push in my feet, very little control or strength in the lower half of my body. However, I was given enough paraplegic, wasn't enough to stop me believing that I could walk, but it definitely wasn't enough to stop me believing that I could fly. Before I left hospital, the very first time that they let me out uh, for a little bit of leave uh, was to find my way from the Sydney Prince of Wales Hospital to the train station 
uh, onto a train and then onto a bus up to an airport where I was lifted into an airplane and I went flying again. I was determined uh, beyond anything to find my way back into the sky. I can say that in the 18 months of rehabilitation, I was given an opportunity uh, to adapt, to find a new way to fly. That aircraft that you see right there is a Piper Cub. Uh, it is a special aircraft that has a certain brake system that allows my damaged legs to still that yellow aircraft. And I took off on my own for the first time since my accident uh, in one of the biggest achievements and highlights by Jonesy himself and taken down to a restaurant to spend time to chat. I remember speaking with Alan Jones. I remember speaking with all sorts of phenomenal humans who wanted to see me uh, achieve what I wanted to do, which was fly. The gentleman in this clip, uh, his name was Mick. Uh, he became a mentor, a friend, a giver of tough love, as I say, and someone who guided me through my rehabilitation. In this moment right there that you can see, he had me in a helicopter of which I'd never flown before, attempting to operate the pedals. We found out that although I couldn't operate most fixed wing pedals uh, in standard aircraft, or aeroplanes, I could in fact operate the pedals in a helicopter. I then went on to re, uh, regain not only a medical certificate for Doug or for my Piper Cub, but a commercial helicopter uh, medical certificate and a commercial helicopter license. So my journey of getting back to walking uh, was a success. Uh, I don't run anywhere, but I never ran anywhere beforehand. My journey back to flying Although I couldn't fly all the fixed wing aircraft that I uh, was used to flying before the accident, I was now flying helicopters. It was a wild, unbelievable life. The message went far beyond one of adventure and adversity. It was a message that allowed me to talk about change. I realized at age 21 that I'd been given a phenomenal opportunity to not only compare highs uh, and experience those highs, but to compare them with lows to take a high higher than what a lot of people do experience in their life, but to then compare it with a low that was unbelievably tragic. What I learned through that process was what we, uh, or where we find our tools, where we learn our biggest lessons. And I can tell you it is in the low moments. So in a time right now of crisis, of a world pandemic, uh, I am sharing as much as I can from this virtual keynote studio uh, on navigating change, on using a mindset toolbox, using a three-step checklist uh, and using adversity to fuel success. So that is my story in a nutshell. Uh, Jonesy is going to jump back on. We're going to discuss a little bit about uh, not only challenge and adversity, but how to live a life with no regrets, how to navigate change. So. Ryan, that's epic. I mean, honestly, that just, I swapped the beer out for, a, uh, sorry, the coffee out for a beer because, mate, <laughs> phenomenal story and ride you just took us on there and thanks for being willing to share that i mean some of that stuff's kind of personal it hits a, it's a lot of nerves i mean for me i remember one of the most emotional moments actually in my life you know i've had have had a lot you know birth of children this that the other but i remember visiting you in in hospital and you know i think the first time you were, you were there just in the bed and the second time you were on the frame and you, and you were walking around the hospital uh, hallways and the third time I, I remember calling you up and saying hey mate i'll, I'll come in hospital and you're like no 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 oh I'll meet you down the road. I'll meet you at the restaurant, you know, down at the spot in Randwick. And I remember sitting there outside this burger shop and wondering where you were. And you're like, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. And I look up the street and you're walking towards me. And like, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting teary thinking about it now. Like, it's phenomenal. Like, it's like, <laughs> like yeah. everyone was saying, like, you're never going to properly, you know, like the doctors, the, the medical, medical advice, you're a complete um, paraplegic, you know, and to go to incomplete like that, it's it's phenomenal. Um, so, yeah. And they, I always tell people they built me a purple wheelchair. It was purple with white wheels and it was all the reason I needed to get out of it. And it was <laughs> in the beginning, it was a permanent diagnosis. And they're so unbelievably careful with what they tell you and the hope that they give you. And I watched a whole lot of people who weren't given enough hope uh, go down a very dark road and I believe not find what their maximum potential was. And uh, that's a hard thing uh, to see. And I believe that those losses and, uh, you know, missing that maximum potential come from them uh, losing the battle above their shoulders. You know, I think what I went through in spinal rehabilitation ward was in fact a mental challenge, not a physical challenge. And yeah. uh, it was sure good to walk to the spot that day. 
do, do you think it's it's because you know people some people don't recover from these things because they get they listen to what's actually been said to them and they go they believe that because you, did did you just kind of try and ignore what was being said to you or how did you disassociate your mind and keep your mind strong when there's overwhelmingly negative thoughts coming in from medical advice from people like that like how did you stay strong and you know right i'm going to get back on this path how i was unbelievably naive if i'm honest and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing you know i did not want to be told what i could and could not achieve one of the most amazing things was to hear success stories of other people who'd found themselves in the situation that I was in yet worked their way from being told that they'll never walk again to walking or at least living a life better than what their original original diagnosis was. So I had a, honestly a severe belief that I had what it took uh, to get better. I just did not know how uh, that recovery would plateau off or when it would, would plateau off. You you mentioned to me, I think badly you broken your back, and I remember us having a chat, and you're like, "No, I've actually broken my back in this many places, and I didn't realize." And they've they've categorized me as you know yeah. X percent, you know, incapacitated. It, it, yeah, and it was in the beginning there was so much focus on a spinal cord injury and at what level that that break was and how bad that burst fracture was and how it damaged the spinal cord, and a spinal cord injury really is quite debilitating, especially from an internal point of view, more than what. Uh, a lot of people uh, realize, but as I was reading through the paperwork, I found that I had actually fractured and broken my back in five different places. Uh, they had decided to operate and stabilize one area of my back, but I had in fact broken, uh, you know, five different, and just broken my other leg. And I simply could not have, it wouldn't have altered my mental state. I was computing everything that I could. And I think that focus on that burst fracture and spinal cord injury the fact I wasn't mental capacity, uh, really, you know, those other four breaks really didn't matter at that point in time. But amazing to look back and realize that's actually the position I was in. It's, it's crazy in your mind. You're a very analytic pilot mind there. You know, it's like, all right, let's let's just focus on on how we get, get back from this rather than focus on the negative things because you can't. You can't let the things overwhelm yeah. you of all the negative things that are happening. We've got some questions coming in actually yeah. over Facebook around uh, what's the three-step checklist and all that um and another one oh did ryan think we'll get to the three-step checklist won't we ryan we're definitely gonna we will that. absolutely we will yeah. okay all right does ryan think his around the world trip helped him fly again when everyone said he couldn't how and did walking flying again help ryan during this global time of crisis in any way um yeah if you hadn't had that experience of flying around the world do you think that you would have you know you were just a bloke that liked to fly but you hadn't gone around the world do you think that you would have had a different mentality to to jumping up and out of the that purple wheelchair i don't i don't believe that flying around the world made my uh, passion for aviation any stronger i was already unbelievably passionate about it hence why i did it in the first place however i do believe that having achieved something that a lot of people I uh, simply didn't think was possible having achieved something that had never been done before sh- had shown me what a normal kid, uh, what a normal person is capable of with the right mindset, with the right tools, with the right team around them. I had a great team around me. I knew that I could clean up my head and work on my mindset. And I knew that I could grab all the tools from all the people I needed to at least operate to my maximum potential, which is really what mattered. So I don't think, the act of flying around the world yeah. uh, and piloting the aircraft help necessarily. I do think that achieving uh, and realizing where my potential and what I could actually uh, do in life, you know, realizing that uh, absolutely helped. It, it changed everything for me, for sure. Oh, it's interesting because coming back from the, the, just not trying to make this about myself for a second, but my experience is like you do something crazy and out there and it does extend you as a human being and takes those blinkers off. So when someone tells you, you know, yeah. oh, something's impossible, you're like, well, I've heard that before, you know, and I, I'm going to kind yeah. of like dismiss that. So it is a powerful thing. And I yeah. think most people stay in a narrow channel and corridor in their lives and they've got to go outside that box and find that room to move because it's, yeah, it, it, to live your life in a box yeah. is so just narrow minded and, um, it limits what you, you have to take done. the blinkers off to realize sorry you have to, you have to take those blinkers off to realize what's possible and one of the biggest things that uh, you, comes to the front of my mind is Kurt Fernley I'm sure it was Kurt yeah. Kurt Fernley who did the Kokoda track right now crawling I mean to like do the epic. Kokoda track 
on your hands and like just on your arms, you know, that's something I dream of doing on my legs, you know, to look outside of your box, to use other people as genuine inspiration, to look at, look at what they've achieved despite whatever adversities come their way, disabilities or setbacks. That is the fuel to remove excuses. That's the fuel to sit back and go, all right, now it's time to buckle down. If he can do it or if she can do it, I can do it too. So take the have blinkers you, off 100%. Have you done Kokoda? No, I haven't. Do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah, can, can, we, can, I, can I do it with you? I mean, I'd love to do it. And it might be uh, something so would, special to do it with you. Yeah, I would I would love to do it. Honestly, this is a terrible place to commit to that because people are watching. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to. I would love to do it. I'd have to kind of branch away from the American fried chicken diet, to be honest. But um, that's you know part of the process. Oh, mate, if you're training enough, the fried chicken diet won't hurt you too much. So, so we'll get you training, <laughs> <laughs> mate. We'll we'll do that. We've committed to it. So I like that. Fantastic. Now I'm gonna go. Um, when you actually had that accident in uh, uh, back in twenty sorry sixteen was it twenty seventeen. 2015 it was the last days of 2015 2015 yeah i had in my mind 2016 um that's when i saw you uh 2015 if you go back there when you immediately had that crash how long till you were able to sort of communicate and talk and you know were sort of or were you lurid straight very aware of what had happened i'd been conscious through the entire ordeal up until when they'd moved me to the helicopter and i'd blacked out because every warden seeing a number of peace coast walked in Immediately, my maybe my pilot analytical numbers head, uh, as you just said, I immediately thought my first thought was, how did he get here so quick? <laughs> you know, and I think that was the first thing that I said to them. So um, the second thing I said to them was basically something along the lines of the engine failed. I did everything I could. And, um, you know, that's, that's a rough conversation to have. But uh, I remember that moment the ongoing conversations with my parents and my family they they were at the hospital my mom never left the hospital um it was having those familiar uh people around me who knew my previous life who could see the transition and the differences uh to be able to talk over things how i was feeling all of that stuff that was unbelievably important i never had success with a psychologist i never did uh, I did not want to tell my problems to someone just to have them turned around and, and reworded back to me. That's my very uh, blunt and you know unfair view of those sessions. However, the people who truly knew me, they were the ones who helped me uh, have the right conversation, straighten out what was in my head and uh, set some goals. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's... Um... Yeah, so you had that family support structure and, and they were a huge part of yeah. the, the support structure you had flying around the world, weren't they? I mean, your family. A hundred percent. And yeah. and like, and I want to say this, Jonesy, because like I am just a normal Aussie kid and I find, you know, we talked about tech, you know, and the first half of telling my story there and I do this every day and I can hear echoes and I'm flustered and I am just a normal Aussie kid. The first time I ever stood up in front of people to share uh, publicly that I was going to fly around the world. I was like six cans in, like I was public speaking ability in a can at that point. I am just a normal Aussie kid. Everything that I've ever achieved has not so much had anything to do with me and who I am, but the team that I built around me. I built a team for the round the world flight. My dad was a truck driver and the milkman. My mum was a stay at home mum. We support network that then banded around me when I was in hospital um, and I mentioned Alan Jones to have people like that from the round the world flight, then spend time with me during my time in, in hospital and ongoing, absolutely life-changing, honestly. So, I mean, your brain does seem, you might say you're a normal guy, but your brain obviously works at sort of a different sort of, uh, pace or a different way to other people. I mean, a lot of people would get, you know, have an injury. I mean, man, I've, I've stubbed my toe and I've, that's caused the end of my day at times, you know, that people let things overwhelm them. Like your brain seems to process things a little bit differently, very rationally. So how, what's what's the relationship that you have with fear? I mean, like is fear something that enters your mind or what what is your biggest fear, for example? Is it, I don't know, tell me. I like to feel safe. I don't like to hang Christmas lights because I don't want to climb up a ladder to get on a roof. I don't feel safe. However, I will climb into an aeroplane and go and tumble through the sky doing aerobatics because I feel 
like I am in a situation that is known I am in control. I don't feel com- in control when I climb up onto a roof. So funny things is that before uh, or are after? my fears, you know, somewhat irrational things. Sorry. Is that before or after? Were you, were you like that beforehand? I mean, like- forever. I was like that as a young kid and, and growing up as we put Christmas lights on the house. Absolutely. I like to be able to risk mitigate, to plan and to understand, but I also only want to fear the things that deserve fear. There's a whole lot of people out there who don't uh, strive to achieve, that don't take chances, all based on absolute irrational thoughts. I am all for, maybe it's the analytical mind, all for sitting down, having a look at what we want to achieve, whatever that may be, laying out all the risks, uh, weighing up the pros and cons and simply deciding on a yes and no answer. Are we going to pursue it uh, or are we not? And then getting to work and making it happen. It's sure. a very it's a very lazy thing. I mean, some people might be observing, you know, the things that you do flying around the world solo at such a young, young age, um, you know, or, you know, paddling a car across the Tasman Sea. It's a very lazy thing, for, I think, for other people to just go, oh, they're just ludicrous risk takers they're you know going off and doing something they shouldn't when they don't really realize the amount of work and preparation that goes into it like uh, and i can see it in you like i don't view myself as a risk taker like i'm not i'm not i'm a risk mitigator it's about bringing things everything down to a level of safety that i'm kind of happy with and flying around the world you know in a single engine plane you can't be making mistakes you know you can't you know take things for granted I mean, did you ever feel guilty leaving your family behind to go on that trip? Did you did you go like now? Do you think about Man. it differently? <laughs> well, back then you were a kid, I suppose, so you probably didn't as much. You, yeah, I think it may have been you, or it was. I was having a conversation at one of these Australian Geographic events. And I'm sure it may have been you. <laughs> were you telling me about how adventure is unbelievably selfish? I'm sure we had this conversation. Yeah. I had a conversation with someone. It was all. Uh, it revolved around how adventure is selfish. And I did not believe that. I thought we were all on this journey together until I was halfway around the world and I realized what burden I had put on the people around me from a financial point of view and uh, you know, the risk, the stress, the worry, all of that. Uh, and it all simply led uh, back to a dream that a 17-year-old kid had. So I did feel guilty about the halfway point. Um, up until that, I was having a grand time. Um, I think at that point in time, I felt guilty. However, when I look back, the round the world flight changed not only my life, but my mom and my dad, my brothers, uh, we all got to experience unbelievably unique things because of that adventure. And that is the reward for taking those risks and doing something bold, doing something great. I think. How many siblings do you have? I have two older brothers. So. And what do they think? I mean, like... Supportive. The whole family was. My brother, uh, you know, wrote sponsorship proposals and my other brother bought me the laptop that we raised the money and we wrote the book on. And, you know, it really was a family affair. Uh, my brothers, and even my mum and dad at times, often refer to themselves. They always get called Ryan's brothers. Oh, you're Ryan's brother. Or, you know, you're uh, Ryan's mum. So that's... Uh, my brothers always give me a little bit of stick for that. But um, unbelievably supportive family. Uh, and I know I could turn around tomorrow and tell them I wanted to attempt whatever it may be and I would have their support. Well, you've already said it, Kokoda, mate. We're doing it. 2022, aren't we? Well, bring it on. <laughs> all right, here we go. Now, look, you've touched on it. And like talking about adventure and challenge, we're all facing a pretty big challenge. Some people to a different degree with this whole COVID-19 pandemic for example whole industries have been just decimated you know people are in lockdown various places around the world are, you know devastated by a lot of deaths you look at new york italy different areas um now you have touched on some of these things but i want to ask the question probably more succinctly into the point what is the biggest asset that you've had or that you've got or received from your recovery uh from a mind, mindset perspective you know what's the biggest asset that you you've got now our mindset and our ability to uh, refine it, our ability to uh, navigate change, crisis, challenge, and adversity, all of these things that we often scare away from is a learned and a refined skill. We're not born resilient as much as we uh, make ourselves resilient through the experiences that we have and the tools that we go out and acquire and place in our mindset toolbox. For me, understanding that life is not all roses, you know, that 
the journey from where you are right now to whatever your end goal, your solution or resolution or whatever problem you're facing to understand that that journey is actually a rough journey. There are obstacles and you will have to jump left or right to get around them, uh, to be unbelievably aware of, uh, the reality of life. Once we get to that point and we accept that we can start to build a mindset uh, of resiliency. Uh, we can start to find tools, little moments from life, turn them into uh, a tool that we place in our mindset toolbox. We start to uh, build this confidence in our ability to tackle uh, adversity. We have all experienced it. We will all experience more. That is just a fact of life. It's part of being human. The sooner we, uh, start to uh, realize that and build up uh, a little army uh, of uh, tools, tips, and tricks that we can use to just, you know, get through it all the better. And for me, I think the accident itself, the highs were great. Don't get me wrong. I definitely learned lessons from the round the world flight, but spinal rehabilitation, learning to walk, uh, going through all of that, that was the chapter of my life that truly made me who I am. Wow. So I suppose this is where that three-step checklist that you mentioned sort of really comes into it. So, and then, by the way, the mindset, uh, yep. mindset toolbox, that's something that you've coined. That's your thing. Cause I haven't heard that before, you know, I, to, uh, it is, is it is. So in the, in the shortest version of it, I found myself in hospital lying in a bed faced with uh, a very long rehabilitation journey, learning to walk, hopefully learning to fly. All of these unknowns were ahead of me. Yeah. I knew it was going to be a very hard journey. I had everyone again from Alan Jones, oh, I might be able to get through it, right? Everyone just wants to see you get better. What that led to, although though, you know, we have to have those suggestions, that is an unbelievable asset that we have. Very lucky to be given those. Too many of them become hard to handle. Your mind becomes cluttered. Uh, you become almost like a deer in the headlights. And that's where I found myself in spinal rehabilitation ward, all of these voices not really knowing what to reach out and grab hold of, not really knowing what to commit to. I was taken out of bed for the very first time and I was put in a wheelchair and wheeled to a spinal rehabilitation ward. Now that was a place in the hospital where quadriplegics and paraplegics were doing everything they could to co introduce to my physio, but I was also into going to roll over. Well, I lifted up one of my chunky legs. I put it on my other leg. I twisted the bottom half of my body and I thought if I could just le lean over and grab the edge of this bed and pull, I'd un, uh, untwist the top half of my body. I'd end up on my stomach. I'd be a victor and I will have rolled over, right? Well, I pulled the side of that bed and I made it halfway up onto my side and the pain in my back from what I now know is multiple breaks and all of this metal was just too much. So I stopped. When I stopped, my right arm was all twisted and I looked through a small hole made by my elbow. And what I saw through that small hole changed my life mate it it changed the way that i thought it changed the way that i had and he'd been diagnosed a quadriplegic no movement or feeling from his chest down very little movement in his arms and his hands here i was lying on this bed feel that life had dealt me but in that moment when i looked at ben i realized what he would have given he was staring right at me i realized what he would have given for just one chance at rolling over and i felt like the absolute worst human on the face of the planet when i was taken back to the ward that night i lay in bed my body was resting and my mind was just racing at a million miles an hour i knew that it was the way that i was feeling after that moment with ben that i needed to remember i wasn't sure how i felt at the time but i knew it was that feeling that i'd need to constantly feed off every time i come up against a challenge or had a hard day and i knew there were plenty of hard days on the horizon but the experience with Ben just added to the confusion in my head. I needed some simple way to take all of these little tips, tricks, and suggestions and find order to the chaos. That's where the mindset toolbox come from. It is simple as this. I believe we're all born with a toolbox, right? It's empty. It's really big. It has drawers, wheels. We take it with us wherever we go in life. The aim of the game is to pick up as many tools as we can, tools that help us uh, navigate, change, challenge, adversity, crisis, and we place them in that toolbox. By taking stories, uh, moments throughout our life, converting them to tools and then placing them in that toolbox, we're taking very easily forgettable moments and lessons and we're placing them in an unforgettable drawer. 
So I could take all these tips and tricks from the people who were around me. I could convert them to tools, place them in that drawer, including the moments with Ben. And then I had a reservoir of resilience, a place where I could reach into at any time to pull out these tools that I needed to get through a hard day. When I pulled apart the moment with Ben, it was the first one I ever unpacked and placed in the toolbox. What I realized is that surface value, sure, he taught me perspective, you know, sure. But as I started to dive into it and unpack it, I realized there was a whole bunch more lessons in there. And it was that moment of reflection and unpacking that uncovered those. Ben had shown me that I needed to focus on the physical abilities that I had as opposed to what I'd lost. He had shown me that not only was a challenge and opportunity to quit, but ever lucky to be a paraplegic. He'd shown me gratitude. And those tools went straight into that mindset toolbox. All throughout the next six months, all throughout the next year and a half of rehab, the planning, all of those stories were unpacked and placed most likely during the night when I couldn't sleep into that mindset toolbox. Now, fast forward to uh, once I was at hospital, I'm in rehab, I realized as good as it was to have a full mindset toolbox and we must have that mm. when we're in a moment of change or challenge or adversity, when we have that feeling of like uncertainty and fear and we're scared and there's all these unknowns of what's ahead, it's kind of hard to reach into a toolbox and pull out exactly the right tool. What I wanted to do was make some form of simple systematic approach that I could share with individuals around the U S Australia and the world some kind of system that I could apply every single time I had a bad day, the same I use the most. And the first uh, step in that three-step checklist is gratitude. It's that lesson that I learned with Ben. To give you a really quick backstory, the reason that I chose a checklist as, as a pilot, when something goes wrong in an airplane, a red light comes on or a warning buzzer sounds, uh, the pilot doesn't just start pressing random buttons and pulling random levers, despite what Hollywood have a list of items to work through in order. You don't skip any. By the time you get to the end, you have hopefully found a potential solution. Now it works so unbelievably well in, in, in aviation. And I knew that for a fact from experience. However, I wanted to create a checklist, not for an airplane, but for life. And that's where the three-step checklist come from. The first step is gratitude. The second step is confidence. And the third step is uh, resilience. Every time you come up against a problem, you apply this checklist, right? Not to find a solution because we all have different problems. There's no golden nugget to solve everyone's problems, right? This places you in a more challenge and change ready mindset. It just puts you in a better place prior to navigating your way through the challenge. And right now we're all up against challenges. So I encourage people to find gratitude just like I did with Ben, just like I did when I realized I was lucky to be a paraplegic. Look at the challenge ahead before you even navigate it find something to be thankful for. There is something, always something to be thankful for. And by doing that, it takes this impossible mountain to climb and it shrinks it down. It takes uh, the entire journey that you're on to whatever that solution, resolution, end goal is and changes your perspective of the entire journey. It makes it easier before you even begin. Uh, the second step is confidence. Confidence is all about having the belief that you can navigate whatever you're up against not by knowing every single step of the entire process from here to the end goal, but by instead understanding that all you need to do is lock in the next step. And it was a lesson from the round the world flight planning days. An amazing gentleman uh, helped me understand that I did not need to know the whole journey of how I was going to plan and fundraise and train or how I was actually going to execute the round the world flight. All I needed was to know what my next step was. It removed my excuses and it meant know what was. Once you've found gratitude, you're thankful. Once you've found confidence, you've got your next step. The last step is resilience. And once again, this comes from understanding that there is no golden nugget when we work through challenge or change or any tough times in life. There's no one thing that will make this just go away. We find resilience by anticipating the need to adapt, by looking forward on that journey, understanding that there will be challenges, starting to write down what potential challenges may uh, come our way. And I know you did this on your adventures. You know, I did it on the round the world flight. This is part of risk mitigation. It's a part of the forward planning, looking ahead and saying, well, what problems could come our way and starting to think of potential solutions. If we do this, when those problems arrive at our doorstep, we don't find ourselves in shock. We're taking those problems and we're turning them simply into part of the process. 
all through anticipating the need to adapt. That's my three-step checklist. It's what we share with individuals and organizations all around the world, simply to put them in a more change and challenge ready mindset. So from an asset point of view, from a, what did I learn from the round the world flight? What did I learn from that time in spinal rehab ward? It is the mindset. Yeah. I've got, I've obviously experienced a lot of those different sort of facets, not to the depth that you have. I mean, I think spinal, uh, I mean, the people need experience, like rather than, you know, you can just say and tell them this because I think it's powerful to hear and I can, I can hear myself using it with other people. But do you think they need to go through that pain, that adversity, that challenge in order for them to really kind of cement the learnings or can they just, you know, hear you talk about it, learn about it and then that's kind of good enough? Is this something that practice makes perfect? I... I think that people do in order to have the full impact to know what it's like to go through spinal ward or to know what it's like to be alone in the middle of the Tasman in a kayak, you have to go through spinal ward or you have to know what it's like. You have to have actually kayaked across that, that stretch of ocean. However, we don't have the life, uh, the years in our life. We don't have, nor do we want to go through all these things to uh, learn these lessons. If I can teach you 80% of what I know through words alone without you having to experience what I experience, then that's my end goal. Because I do believe that when people hear my story or your story attached with whatever content you provide, takeaways, whatever takeaways I provide in the form of the checklist, they can compare that checklist, the examples that I've provided with adversity they've been through in their life. Mm. And in many cases, the adversity they've experienced is far beyond or different, you know, than the adversity I've experienced. So I may not truly understand their point of view, but what this is, is a catalyst to get them thinking, uh, to start to realize that a systematic approach can be crafted and refined. Your mindset is a learned and refined skill uh, to make people uh, want to go out there and build a toolbox to better themselves, to better prepare themselves for, whatever the un unknowns are. And, and if we look at the world right now, those who have gone out and equipped themselves to work through crisis and change uh, are the ones pivoting and doing uh, well in this crazy, crazy time that, that we're living in. I absolutely love it. Yeah, you're, you're right. You just take that checklist, you, you shine on your own experiences because you're right. You can't say what other people have gone through. You, you definitely can't. Um, so that it's hyper powerful and thank you for well, for me for providing that to me so I can go you know what actually I was using Ryan's checklist a victim mentality you can fall into and I've definitely found that I, I have that exact same experience at home versus on expedition on expedition you know I have a very expansive open mind and I you know I'm glad for the experience and it's all about taking on information and it's teaching me to be a better person but at home, I find myself falling into a closed mindset. I really do because I'm safe in a comfortable yeah. environment. We're tight on time now because I'm trying to keep this fairly fairly wrapped up around an hour. But I have kind of two more questions that I'd like to ask you. And the first one, uh, I want to talk about regret for a very quick moment. Do you have a moment in life that you've, you know, that, that you regret? You know, looking back ne negatively, is there a moment in life that you'd change? Um, you know, have... I think regretting a moment and wanting to change a moment are two different things in my eyes. Uh, would I want to change things that have happened in my life? Would I want to change the outcome of the accident if I could? Sure. Who wouldn't? Can I? No. So do I worry about that and overanalyze it? No, I, I try not to. Mm you know, the old uh, idea of fault versus responsibility, you know, something may not be our fault, but we are responsible for the way we I would change anything. Regret the decisions I've made because I believe I've made all the right decisions uh, throughout life. I've always found myself at a crossroad and I remember writing uh, the end uh, chapter in Born to Fly. And I remember talking about how life is just this big choose your own adventure. And the road that I had chosen at 17 led to two or three years of wild, wild adventures, you know, from fundraising and planning to flying around the world, to writing a book, to meeting amazing people and, and having amazing experiences. And I wrote in that book that I hope the next uh, road that I chose, the next decision that I made was the, the right road. And when I first read that uh, back after the accident, I was in tears and uncertain at that point in time whether i had chosen the right road however 
it's unbelievably important for me uh, and it always has been to look back at all the decisions I've made along the way and be proud that I always have made what I believe in that moment to be the right decision. Yeah. Where that leads me, that's out of my hands. Um, that's, that's, that's bigger than you and me. But um, I will continue to make what I think are the right decisions and uh, you know, help as many people as we can and impact as many people as we can and, and see where that leads. You're a good man, Ryan, because I, I don't think many people can turn back and go, you know what, I, I feel right in all the decisions I've made. So I think that's that's a, sh- a, sh- a light shine back at you. I mean, like, good on you. Um, the last question I think I have, and I, like, I, I love this question. If the, your future self could come back to this point in time right now and tell you something that you need to hear, what would that be? As someone who moved to the other side of the world and pursued sharing a message uh, as my new passion and purpose in life, uh, I've since found a life here that I love. And, you know, I'd like to think that that person would come back and tell me that this was all worthwhile. You know, that the story and the pain and the experiences that I went through, uh, in fact, become uh, life-changing little pieces of wisdom advice, uh, you know, in inspiration for a whole number of people, uh, not just here in the States, but that's the mind of someone who is just, you know, you're, you're on your path and you, you're set and you're like, this is the right path. And you're so certain. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. You know, I, my future, Justin comes back and tells me to, to, to stop being so bloody lazy, you know, to, 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 <laughs> to create more rather than consume, you know? And, um, yeah. so yeah, fantastic, Ryan. I absolutely love it. If people need to want to get in touch with you to, you know, get them to speak to your team or even just, they've got an adventure question or some young kid might be listening to this or watch this in 10 years time about flying around the world solo. How can people get in contact with yeah. you? Uh, you can jump on the website, which is listed here. So it's ryancampbell.co. It's not .com. I cannot afford the M just yet. It's uh, That's probably something my future self would tell me is you finally got the M somehow. <laughs> uh, ryancampbell.co. Jump on there and have a look or email me directly, ryan at ryancampbell.co. We'd love to help. We'd love to chat, answer questions. Just uh, be there for whatever you need. So. Yeah, fantastic. Um, look, Ryan, this has been an absolute blast. I'll, I'll make sure that when these videos go live that all your links to your your website, to your YouTube, your Instagram, all that sort of stuff is up um, so people can reach out. It's been phenomenal. I mean, I'm, I feel bad that I can't give you a virtual hug because of one, well, COVID, first of all, <laughs> but two, uh, because we're on other sides of the planet. So I'm going to raise a beer to you and mate, say, this has been, out, and that's your port, is it? I love it. It is well and truly. <laughs> are, we, are we just going to stay on and have a chat for a while and see where, where we go? Down maybe, potentially. Maybe, maybe I mean, it's only 10 that. past 10 on Tuesday night. The night is young. <laughs> it is a Tuesday night. And uh, well, <clears throat> I probably should wrap this up. So Ryan, I'm going to take you off for a second. Thank you so much. We'll put all the details up. I'm going to throw up... Uh, oh, sorry. We had another question. Sarah Davies uh, just popped up. What did she say? She said... Love the mindset toolbox and checklists, simple concepts and so effective and valuable. So yeah, 100% is. There was another comment, I'll, I'll throw that up there. Another comment that we've had is, oh wow, well look, I think this person's a little bit biased, but um, Lauren said, Justin Jones, you are damn sexy. Um, thank you, Lauren, I appreciate that. <laughs> Fuchsia, thank you so much for sharing your story and how you respond to such adversity, Ryan. It's absolutely inspirational. Adventure thinking, uh, okay, perfect. So, I am going to drop Ryan off. Thank you so much, Ryan, because I want to talk about a couple of little things briefly. So, let's put this to me. Um, a phenomenal story, phenomenal guy. Like, seriously, Ryan is out of control awesome. Like, he really is. Like, I've known him since 2014, 15, around the world trip. Like, uh, super upbeat bloke for what he's kind of gone through. Uh, I don't know if I'd have that medal. Like really, just thinking about it. Now, and that's what these conversations are all about. It's about it's much learning for me as it is for other people and showcasing tools that other people need to know. Um, I'm on a journey to try and better myself and to, you know, create a better Justin who creates a better environment for his family, for his friends, for people around him. So I want to talk about next week for a second. Next week, we have got another very exciting person on and that is going to be the beautiful, the lovely, the fantastic, the wild, the courageous, the adventurous, 
Lucy Barnard. Now, Lucy is a pretty phenomenal... Oh, I've got to move this slide. She's pretty phenomenal in that she is trying to walk the length of the world, starting at the very, very bottom of South America, the very bottom, right up to the top of Alaska. And Lucy is three years into this journey, three years into this journey, and she's had to come home because of the COVID pandemic. So we literally caught up with her two weekends ago and uh, three years into a journey to have to sort of down tools for a while and spend six months, however long she needs to at home until she can finally con- recontinue this journey. So we are going to have that 12 p.m. on next Wednesday. I forget the day. I think it's the 27th. Um, 27th May, 12 p.m., Lucy Barnard is going to be on talking about her journey, the things that she's learned, she's unpacked. So that is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal fun chat. Now, every Adventure Thinking sort of session, Adventure Thinking live session, I try to sort of leave you, I suppose, with a thought, you know, and I also want to leave you with a bit of a fun video. But the thought for this week is, you know, to follow on the theme of Ryan's gratitude is is around kindness. You know, I think kindness and gratitude come sort of hand in hand. You know, the the way you think about the world and you're thankful for it versus uh, the kindness that you actually give off as well. So I think out there today, and we will have the, the fantastic Seb Terry on one of these days to talk about tininess, kindness, is to go out there and treat yourself a little bit kinder, treat other people around you a little bit kinder, and just see if there's a random act of kindness that you can do over this next week. And I think that really helps. Helps you become a better person, helps you be a little bit more graceful and gratu- uh, have practice gratitude. Um, yeah, that's it, really. Go out there, be kind to yourself, kind to the world. That is the moment... If you can paint a little picture for you, we've been paddling for 47 odd days. I've just jumped in the water and had to scrub these barnacles off off the bottom of the kayak. And I jump back in, the sun is just starting to set, and then we get surprised by a couple of little visitors. Look Look at that. He likes the torch, eh? Look at the size of that thing. Oh, he's coming up this side. Man, this is freaky. I tell you what they're doing. You can hear them rubbing their bodies up against the kayak and the rudder and the Oh, this is really scary, Jay. What do you reckon? Oh, this is pretty intense. We can take There's two, two of them, you reckon? There's at least two of them. And they're just circling the kayak. And, and just to mention on camera, we're both naked. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting here like little school kids. We're f***ing freaked out of our minds right now. We don't know what's going on. All right, hope that left a little smile on your face today. Guys, have an epic one. It's Tuesday over there in Nashville, Wednesday here in Australia, but wherever you are, happy trails, happy adventuring. Catch you later, everyone.